Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to our meeting today. Um, I'm sure that uh, um, you're excited to hear a presentation that we have today on Haifu from uh, Dr. Kagash. Um, and of course, we are still uh, meeting virtually, as you can tell. Um, we have not yet gotten a, um, uh, a date on when we'll be, be returning to in-person meetings. But until then, we will still continue uh, the uh, live streams on the third Saturday of every month. Um, our uh, informed prostate cancer support group principals are Bill Lewis, our president and newsletter uh, summaryist, uh, Jean Van Vliet, our director and treasurer, Steve Pendergast, our secretary and newsletter editor. I, I hope you're all getting the newsletter in your mailbox. And if not, please do check your, uh, the email box, I should say. Uh, and please do check our website for those. They have a, a huge amount of information um, and get sent out about a, uh, within the week before our meetings. Uh, Bill Manning is our director and videographer. Uh, myself, Aaron Lamb, is the director and uh, facilitator. And uh, John Tassie is our webmaster. And then, of course, there, there's you, all 900 members plus. Uh, everyone is a volunteer, and you can be too. So our support to you comes in the way of our website, uh, www.ipcsg.org. I highly recommend uh, checking it out. There's quite a wealth of information there for from all sorts of uh, treatment options, as well as uh, uh, the, the newsletter, um, which contains a lot of uh, uh, cutting edge um, medical research papers um, included in there. They also have the um, summaries of our, our prior meetings, presentations, um, really excellent uh, information, useful to a lot of people. Um, we also have the, the monthly video streaming that you're on right now on the third Saturday of each month. But perhaps the most important thing uh, that we offer is the hotline number. And that's uh, uh, for anybody that needs any kind of assistance uh, with um, trying to obtain the best information that they can uh, find for choosing the right treatment um, that, uh, that they need. And that goes beyond just the uh, particulars of uh, prostate cancer itself, but any support that you need, please do call that hotline. Um, and uh, Gene is typically the person that, that answers and he can put you in contact with one of the other members that can um, uh, be quite useful in answering a lot of questions that you have. Uh, we do need volunteers at any time to help us out. Um, we, uh, Bill Lewis has been doing a fantastic job uh, as well as some of the other directors in um, recruiting uh, new speakers, but we're always interested in finding out uh, what new topics our members would like to hear about, uh, finding new doctors that our members feel are, are exceptional, uh, that they would like to have come and speak, um, as well as just helping to you know, find the, the, you know, find a place in our schedule that works with those doctors. Um, we are planning for a roundtable um, uh, experience session, probably in March of this coming year. And uh, we already have two volunteers that are going to be sharing uh, what they've been going through in the way of treatment. Uh, we would like one additional person. So if, if you have been going through, you know, especially recent treatment in the last uh, year or two, uh, you've likely encountered a lot of new, um, uh, uh, new technology, uh, such as like the PSMA uh, imaging, um, uh, new uh, radiation techniques, whatever it might be. Uh, we'd be interested in um, having you share your experience with everybody. I, I would say that, you know, that is an extreme, if you've never attended one of those meetings, it is an extremely important um, piece of, of uh, treatment for people. Um, just as a uh, tangent here, uh, it was a roundtable that uh, was the first time that I attended a, an IPCSG meeting. And I walked in finding out that I had stage four cancer just, I think, within a week of the meeting. And um, I, I was you know, a nervous wreck, but hearing what other people had to say, say seeing the situation that they were in at that, at that point, and, and seeing that they had gotten through uh, a, you know, a trying time just like I had was so reassuring. It was, it was a very beneficial meeting. So uh, I please encourage you to attend that as well as uh, help out if you can. 
Um, we also do need volunteers for taking uh, the hotline calls. Uh, again, please just contact us either through the website or the hotline if you'd be willing to help out. Um, so our support group purpose is we share patient-focused experience on becoming your own case manager through informing, networking, and caring. We are a group of experienced participants, but we are not medical professionals, and any sharing by any one of our group may not be a substitute for your own medical counsel. And we do need your support. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Therefore, all donations are tax deductible. Uh, there's no medical or religious affiliations. And of course, during the uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, our expenses do continue to be very much the same. Uh, we have uh, our newsletter that we have to put out, the, the website, um, the you know, setting up the Zoom webinars, um, uh, all of these uh, things uh, continue to um, uh, cost us money. And so uh, we do um, uh, ask you to please make a donation if you can. You can do it online on the website via PayPal or you can send a check to the address shown here. And that uh, address is, is also available on the website. Uh, our next meeting is gonna be January 15th. And of course that's to 2022, not 2021. Um, and uh, we will be having our annual visit uh, from Dr. Munt from UCSD. Uh, he will be uh, um, giving us uh, the latest and greatest information on radiation treatment techniques. And as in previous years, he will likely be uh, bringing along a number of other doctors uh, to um, share in the presentation. So it's, it's always an excellent uh, meeting uh, with a lot of good information, a lot of good questions that come up. So uh, we encourage you to attend. Um, however, for today's meeting, uh, we are going to have a presentation by Dr. Robert Pagosh. And uh, he will be speaking on high intensity focused ultrasound, also known as HIFU and cryoablation, Ab cryoablation, <laughs> hopefully I pronounced that right. Um, he is the medical director of Western States uh, HIFU. And uh, a few other uh, things about Dr. Pagash is that he's the most experienced urologist in the Western United States in the use of uh, thermotherapy for benign prostate cancer growth. And uh, he offers two leading minimally invasive therapies for non-surgical treatment of prostate cancer in men. Um, and uh, I, will, I will leave it to Dr. Uh, Pagash for further introduction. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, um, oh, and before I turn it over, as always, uh, please go ahead and submit your questions using the Q&A function in Zoom webinar. And uh, we will address all the questions at the end. So uh, with that, uh, Dr. Pagash. Um, so let me just start with a little, uh, a couple of issues related to prostate cancer and, um, some of the debate that still is ongoing today in the urology community, uh, whether or not we should be diagnosing prostate cancer as we have in the past. Should we be aggressive with PSA screening? Um, if we do make a diagnosis of prostate cancer, uh, there are still many people in urology, uh, principally in the academic side who feel that uh, prostate cancers don't always need to be treated. I will tell you from the outset, I am not in that group. Uh, if we do decide to treat, we have a lot of options out there. We have surgery, we have radiation, we have freezing, we have heating, we have laser procedures, we have a number of different ways of, of treating this disease. Uh, when we diagnose prostate cancer, obviously it's a cancer that occurs uh, later on in life uh, interestingly, though, the youngest patient now with prostate cancer is 28 years old, uh, being treated at the National Institutes of Health. Um, your risk of prostate cancer certainly increases if there is a family history on the male side of prostate cancer. Uh, so we tend to want to start screening at an earlier age. Uh, typically, we start at age 50. Uh, I actually now screen patients starting around age 45. And if there's a family history, I start at age 40. Um, but if you look at this uh, slide and see where we're diagnosing most of the cases, the next slide is kind of interesting because look at the percentage of deaths by age group from prostate cancer. And what this really says is we're not doing a very good job treating patients later on in life when they are diagnosed with prostate cancer. We're not diagnosing nearly as many as we do 
uh, in earlier ages, or earlier decades, and yet the number of deaths certainly from prostate cancer, not from other causes, goes up dramatically with time. We tend not to be very aggressive. Um, the uh, incidence of, of prostate cancer death has changed pretty dramatically, and it has changed dramatically in large part because of the lack of treatment and lack of diagnosis uh, that has been going on for many, many years now. Uh, if you go back to the early 2000s, we lost almost 50,000 men per year from prostate cancer. With aggressive screening and treatment, that number declined to about 24,000 in 2014. Well, this year will be another year of increased prostate cancer mortality. We're gonna lose close to 35,000 men from prostate cancer this year. Every single year since 2014, that number has been going up. We'll talk about metastatic prostate cancer without death in, in a little bit, and you'll see why this uh, lack of screening has led to this and also lack of treatment. Um, it's a very common disease. We diagnose about a quarter of a million new cases in the US annually. Um, one in seven men are gonna be diagnosed with prostate cancer every year. Um, prostate cancer is cancer. This is a thing I try and, and emphasize when I give a talk, when I talk to individual patients. Uh, this is not a, a benign entity, it's something growing in the prostate, which is sort of what a lot of people believe these days, that you just can watch this disease grow, and at some point there's some uh, signal or sign that says it's time to treat. This is, we don't have that. We don't have it because PSA is not accurate enough to tell us when prostate cancer is getting dangerous. We don't have imaging studies to tell us that. So I err on the side of caution and say, if someone has prostate cancer, it is better to be treated than watch this grow. Uh, over the years, we've seen dramatic increases in advanced prostate cancer because of surveillance, because of lack of PSA screening. And over time, we see this trend to more advanced cases of prostate cancer. Um, when the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force in 2012 came out against routine screening, for prostate cancer, there was a dramatic decrease in PSA testing by primary care providers. To this day, that continues, even though the task force has now changed those recommendations. But what's really troubling is when you look, for example, at the last bullet here, the percentage of men diagnosed with high-grade prostate cancer has increased dramatically uh, over the last several years. So we see that trend on and on. There was a time when it was not that common to see advanced cancer because of aggressive screening. That has now changed, and we're seeing a lot more of that. I see it all the time in the office when I see patients coming in with uh, requests for treatment, and oftentimes I have to tell them, I can't successfully eradicate your cancer with HIFU alone. We're seeing larger volumes of tumor. Uh, this is something that is not going away. So one of the first takeaways I wanna to suggest to you is when you have your annual physical examination from your primary care physician, number one, that doctor needs to check your prostate because 15% of prostate cancers don't elaborate PSA. So we get lulled into a false sense of security for some men when they're told that PSA is normal but no one did a rectal examination to see if there's any firm area in the prostate. And your doc has to do a PSA. We'll talk about the type of PSA testing in a little bit. So uh, talking again about older men, uh, only a very small percentage of older men in the 75 to 80 year cohort are receiving curative treatment. And yet we saw before in the previous slide, the significant increase in mortality in those patients. Uh, the arbitrary cutoff of 75 for prostate cancer treatment makes no sense whatsoever. It's not how what your absolute age is, it's what your physiological age is. And if you have a family history that says that 
your grandfather lived until he was 95 years old and you're 75, don't assume you're not going to make it to 95. Um, and with lifestyle changes and all the other uh, changes in healthcare that are allowing us to live longer and better lives, uh, it's becoming increasingly important that we recognize that many patients who are over the age of 75 should receive aggressive treatment for prostate cancer. If somebody has a biopsy that shows prostate cancer, more than a third will have either a larger volume or more aggressive cancer than what is found on biopsy. So the concept of saying to somebody, well, you just have a small amount of uh, moderately aggressive cancer, Gleason 3 plus 3, and your PSA is 6, we can just watch you, doesn't make a lot of sense to me because if more than a third of men have more cancer or more aggressive cancer somewhere else in the prostate, we can't really say you should be watched. In fact, when we do prostate biopsies, and I typically do 16 samples, when we do prostate biopsies, we're sampling less than 1% of the prostate. Less than 1%. So we don't know what's in the other 99% of somebody's prostate. When we do make a diagnosis of prostate cancer, just looking at it under a microscope is probably not adequate anymore. Uh, and genomic testing is becoming increasingly important to understand the true aggressive nature or non-aggressive nature of a prostate cancer. Um, when we do biopsies, we can do standard template biopsies, but we can also do fusion biopsies, which I do routinely in my office um, to try to localize areas of cancer that are seen on an MRI. So we have better ways of, of making a diagnosis, but once we've made a cancer diagnosis, it doesn't stop at the Gleason grade. You have to do genomic testing to truly understand the potential of, for prostate cancer growth and spread in the future. So how should screening be done? Annual DRE, as I said before, that's an absolute, don't let your primary care doctor not do it. It needs to be done because prostate cancers don't always produce PSA. Again, 15% of them do not. What's the cutoff for PSA? In my office, if you're under the age of 65, 2.5 is the cutoff. If you're using, uh, if you're taking finasteride or dutasteride or Propecia, you need to double your PSA. So a lot of primary care physicians don't understand that if somebody's PSA is 2.2, but they're taking one of those other medications either for hair loss or for uh, benign prostate uh, symptoms to urinate better, you have to double the PSA because those medications decrease PSA by 47%. So a 2.2 PSA for someone who's taking finasteride is actually 4.4. So if you're on that medication, make sure your primary care physician understands that. Uh, a big debate within urology now is should we be doing routine multiparametric prostate MRIs? Uh, we don't have a clear answer on that. And one of the reasons we don't is we can get lulled into a false sense of security because unfortunately, a multiparametric prostate MRI will miss 40 to 60% of prostate cancer. So the most commonly used imaging study that we have for prostate cancer misses half of them. If we do a multiparametric prostate MRI and it does show us lesions, then it is advantageous because we can now potentially target those areas with what's called a fusion biopsy. We take the MRI and fuse those images into an office ultrasound system so we can see on a screen where the MRI saw some abnormalities and aim for that specific area. And it's remarkably precise. And again, if the MRI shows something, it's very advantageous. If it doesn't show it, it doesn't mean you don't have prostate cancer. It just means it didn't show any definite areas. So when we do these fusion biopsies, it allows us to aim not only anywhere in the prostate, but also target very small abnormalities, something as small as a few millimeters, if it's seen on the MRI, can now be targeted successfully, instead of estimating or guessing uh, where the uh, abnormality may be. 
let's say we have a diagnosis of prostate cancer. Let's say it's a localized prostate cancer based upon our testing. Um, a very common way of dealing with this is active surveillance. It used to be called watchful waiting, but politically correct wasn't, watchful waiting wasn't a politically correct term, so we went to active surveillance. Um, so we're watching somebody actively. The question is, what are we waiting for? Uh, PSA is not a very good biomarker. When my prostate cancer was diagnosed four and a half years ago, my total PSA was 1.1. So my prostate cancer didn't produce PSA. If I waited until it finally got to be over four, I would have had a lot more cancer, either within the prostate or somewhere else in my body. So the question I always have is, what are you waiting for when your doctor says, let's watch this? What, what is the PSA cutoff that's going to get your doctor to say, oh, we should treat this now? What's the imaging uh, going to show that makes someone say, we should treat you now? In the best case scenario, with favorable pathology, meaning not very high grade, and a PSA that's under 10, and all several other parameters that we look at, when your prostate cancer is diagnosed, there is a 14% chance it is already outside of the prostate. 14%. That number goes up over time as prostate cancers grow, as they get into a lymphatic channel, a blood vessel, grow along nerve sheaths. So to me, watchful waiting or active surveillance doesn't make a lot of sense. I want to cure prostate cancer before it gets outside of the prostate. We can do surgery. Surgery is an excellent way to take care of prostate cancer. Stop to think about it for a moment. If your prostate cancer is localized to the prostate and you take out the prostate, it's a great way to cure cancer. The challenge with surgery, even if it's done robotically, as most prostate cancer procedures are done these days, is that there are significant side effects for some patients. Roughly 35% of men having prostate cancer surgery will have some degree of urinary incontinence afterwards. Could be a small amount. Maybe you just use a pad or two or three a day and change them when they get damp, but you could be using diapers too. From a quality of life perspective, that's huge for most men. Erectile dysfunction, depending upon your age, existing erectile function, and a number of other factors, the incidence of erectile dysfunction following surgery is approximately 50%. A lot of it depends on the skill of the surgeon, the experience of the surgeon, but a lot of it's just related to having surgery. We can use radiation. If you're having a talk in, uh, in January, I see, uh, from UCSD, uh, that has an excellent radiation department, by the way. There are many different types of radiation out there. But one of the most recent studies looking at radiation failure rates said that at five years, 30%, 30% of men have their prostate cancers back. And that, for me, is the dilemma with radiation because we don't have a good treatment if radiation fails. If we do surgery, the patient is totally incontinent, completely. There is no control of urination because when you take out a prostate after radiation, you remove the sphincter as well because they're fused. We can do HIFU as a salvage treatment after radiation fails, but our results are not very good. We have a 60% failure rate at three years because radiated tissue doesn't take up heat very well. So most men end up having what our last governor, Jerry Brown, is currently on, and that is a medication that takes away all of your testosterone, which takes away all of your energy, your mental focus, your sexual desire. It takes away a lot of things that are important for your everyday functioning in life. So as primary treatment for prostate cancer, I shy away from that, and that's why I've moved into the HIFU realm, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Cryoablation was a very common procedure until HIFU became more uh, commonplace. It is done, by the way, at UCSD. Uh, they have an excellent uh, physician there who does cryoablation. Uh, I, my cryoablation practice has decreased significantly and has been replaced with HIFU. Um, but cryoablation by passing needles into the prostate will lower the prostate temperature to minus 40 degrees centigrade. Uh, it has a much lower incidence of erectile dysfunction, excuse me, of, of incontinence compared to uh, surgery. 
but the ED rate is extremely high, at least 50%, as high as 90%, uh, depending upon where the cancer is. And in many cases, you have to tell a patient if there's a cancer on both sides of the prostate, you are not going to get spontaneous erections afterwards. So that is a big issue with cryoablation. There's also another concern with cryoablation, and that is you must leave about five to six millimeters of prostate tissue that surrounds the urethra untreated. Well, if you leave it untreated and there's cancer there, you haven't done a complete cancer treatment. So for patients who have prostate cancers that are either seen on MRI or we know from the biopsy more towards the middle of the prostate, cryo is probably not a great procedure because we have to leave that five or six millimeter rim of tissue untreated. Um, there are a number of other treatments available. Uh, laser is becoming more commonplace uh, as we're able to see lesions on MRI, but you have to be able to see it on the MRI to do a successful laser procedure. I'm going to be focusing on HIFU for the rest of the talk now. I'm going to skip through a lot of this. Um, I will briefly mention the CAPRA score. CAPRA is something that I use a great deal of in the office to help educate patients. CAPRA goes back many years to UC San Francisco, uh, and they did a very interesting study, and that was, uh, can we identify characteristics of people who have prostate cancer at the time of diagnosis that may predict failure in the future? Uh, and they did this for patients who underwent radical prostatectomies. And so they looked at the PSA level, they looked at the Gleason score, they looked at the clinical stage, was it localized or not? They looked at the percentage of positive cores and they looked at the age of the patient. And you can indeed come up with some very interesting information. And the first is if you have the most favorable CAPRA score there is, meaning a PSA that's under six, Gleason grade three plus three, et cetera. Like I said before, you have a 14% chance that, that prostate cancer is already out of the prostate. The next CAPRA number takes you to 25%. Than 35%, 40%, on and on. So the more cancer that there is, the more aggressive the cancer is, uh, the more likely it is to have spread outside of the prostate. Again, that takes me back to my philosophy of treating prostate cancer earlier rather than later. In years past, we didn't have too many options for prostate cancer treatment. Uh, we, could have, we could do nothing. Why do we do nothing? Because the side effects of what we were uh, offering patients were significant, or we could go the, to the end of the spectrum and say there's surgery and radiation. Um, HIFU has changed that, and it has changed it significantly, because now you have something that takes you away from surgery and radiation with the potential for those side effects or re high recurrence rates, but also gives you the comfort of having a treatment so you're not watching your prostate cancer grow and wondering every morning uh, is that I make the right decision by not having this treated, you can now have an outpatient procedure with HIFU that is done on an outpatient basis. Uh, I will tell you my recovery, it's quick recovery. My recovery was uh, almost instantaneous. I was back at work a few days later. Um, it is truly the game changer for prostate cancer treatment uh, that is between the realm of not treating or the traditional treatments. Um, I actually need to update this slide. I'm sorry, I did not. It's been worldwide used for 22 years now. Um, we are well in excess of 100,000 treatments worldwide. Actually, we're closer to 150,000 now. Uh, and in October 2015, we were the 46th country to approve HIFU. Uh, it took us quite a while to do that. It started actually back in 1999 uh, when the first published paper came out uh, from Japan. Uh, it is a completely non-invasive technique. Uh, we use very uh, high intensity, focused ultrasound waves to create heat. And we will raise the temperature of every area that we treat to somewhere between 92 and 100 degrees uh, Celsius in a three second burst of ultrasound energy. Uh, we, have it, so we use something called the focal point, that's where the heat is created. And heat dissipates very quickly uh, in areas that are far away from that focal point. And so it's essentially a triangle. And if you ever, as a kid, took a magnifying glass and tried to focus the sun on a leaf and saw some smoke come out, that's basically what HIFU does, except we don't have the smoke. Um, but we're taking diffuse energy and aiming it at a focal point that's roughly the size of a grain of rice. 
And every three seconds, we create these grains of rice. And if you look on that picture on the left, those yellow uh, cylinders, those are the lesions that we create. And we line them up in different areas of the prostate. We can treat a whole prostate. We can treat half a prostate, a third of a prostate, a tiny area in the prostate. We can uh, create hockey stick patterns. We do all sorts of, of treatment designs for a patient's individual prostate cancer. And it's truly the only treatment that we have for prostate cancer that allows us to do that. Uh, this is a probe that we use. It's an ultrasound probe, kind of like the probe that your doc uses to do a biopsy, except this one, again, is a lot more sophisticated. Again, representation of the different types of treatment that we can do. Uh, focal therapy is becoming increasingly common. I'm gonna give you some data on that in a minute or two. Hemiablation is treating half of the prostate. Uh, I do still a lot of whole gland treatments uh, because I think HIFU is excellent for that. Uh, many people who do HIFU tend to shy away from those treatments because you create a lot of heat in the prostate. Uh, and sometimes it can be a challenge to, to complete a case uh, but having been at this for 17 years, I'm pretty comfortable uh, doing that now. Um, just a picture of the device itself. We sit at a computer keyboard, and that's how we do the procedure. There's no hands on the, into the patient. There's no cutting. There are no needles. It's just the computer keyboard that controls that transducer that generates the HIFU beam which subsequently generates heat into whatever part of the prostate we're looking at. We have uh, a number of zones that we create in a prostate. Typically, most prostates will have three zones. So there's a top, middle, and bottom zone. We program into the computer the areas that we want to treat with what are called skittles, these little dots. And those skittles represent one of those yellow cylinders you saw in a previous slide. And so we can create those skittles in any part of the prostate. And during the treatment, we're seeing four continuous uh, images, ultrasound images that allow us to see the effects of our treatment. But one of the other remarkable things about the Sonoblade device, as opposed to another uh, device that's on the market, is it allows us to see a representation of how much heat we're delivering to the prostate at any uh, moment in time. So if we see on that top right image there, orange bars. Orange bars mean that we got a lot of heat into the prostate. Yellow means we got a good amount of heat, not quite as much as orange. Then other colors are green or gray. Green is the computer telling us, you know what? You didn't get enough heat into that area. Gray means the computer doesn't know. And how does it know or not know? There's a radio frequency beam that is fired into the area we're aiming for a millisecond before the actual ultrasound is fired. And then it's reflected back after the ultrasound. And that reflection is interpreted by the computer as a lot of heat, a reasonable amount of heat, not enough heat. Procedures vary in time, uh, depending on the size of the prostate, the amount of prostate tissue being treated. Uh, we use general anesthesia because you cannot move a millimeter during treatment or the prostate will shift. And what we're aiming for is no longer what we're going to put HIFU into. So you have to stay very uh, still. Everybody gets a catheter after a procedure because there's going to be some swelling. Uh, it can stay in for a couple of days if it's a small area that's treated. It can stay in for two weeks or more sometimes. Uh, usually patients go home an hour or so after the procedure. Uh, there is absolutely no pain after a HIFU procedure because that same heat that's destroying prostate tissue also destroys the nerve tissue in the prostate. Uh, so there's no nerve transmission, so you have no pain. Um, and I will attest to that because when I had my treatment, I felt nothing at all afterwards. Now, uh, let's look at a couple of, of numbers related to how uh, HIFU compares to some other treatments relative to some of the side effects I talked about before. Um, it is remarkably effective in treating prostate cancer. Uh, a lot, depending upon the model of device that's being used, depending upon the skill of the HIFU doctor, uh, the overall uh, incidence of prostate cancer cure in my hands is 93% if you have a 
a small to medium volume of Gleason 3 plus 3 cancer. When you go with higher grade diseases of larger volume of cancer, those numbers do change, but the urinary incontinence is indeed 3% or less. We do not see rectal fistulas anymore as we did in the early days. We've learned how to stop that. Uh, urethral strictures can still occur, uh, meaning there's some scar tissue in the urethra. Uh, we now use something called a notch technique, so we have minimized that. And our, our stricture right now in my practice is now at 5%, uh, scarring at the bladder neck, at the junction of the prostate and the bladder, 1%. Um, if you look at disease-free survivals, now there's a lot of studies out there. I've chosen a few, but if you look at disease-free survival, uh, HIFU stacks up very favorably next to surgery and radiation, so it's just as effective with a far, far, far lower incidence of sexual dysfunction and a far higher rate of continence, depending upon the amount of prostate tissue that's treated and the grade of the cancer. Um, in the last several years, most of the HIFU literature that we uh, quote has come from Europe because HIFU is much more commonly used in Europe. Uh, it is, uh, in fact, one of the mainstays of therapy over there. Um, we look at uh, that data giving us 85% erectile function, 98% urinary continence, um, metastasis-free, cancer-specific, survival at five years, 98%, truly remarkable numbers that we see with HIFU. Again, without the side effects of the other treatments. Um, I'm gonna pass over this one. Um, in 2019, uh, the British, uh, Journal of Urology published data on focal therapy. And it was remarkable because the debate had been all along, well, are we really giving adequate treatment if we're just doing part of the prostate? If we're not doing radical surgery, if we're not radiating an entire prostate, are these going to be reasonable results or are we going to see very high recurrence rates? And the answer is we do not. We do not see over very high recurrence rates. And stop to think about it for a moment. If you have prostate cancer that's localized to part of your prostate, why are we treating the entire prostate? HIFU is called the male lumpectomy. We don't do radical mastectomy in women just because they have breast cancer, unless it's appropriate to do that, we do a lumpectomy. If somebody has a kidney cancer, we no longer take out the entire kidney. In every case, oftentimes we'll take out the area where there's a cancer. Well. The prostate is no different, except for this issue. And this is an important issue. Remember I said that when you do a, an MRI of the prostate, it misses 40 to 60% of prostate cancer. Well, we don't have a good enough, we have not had until recently, a good enough imaging technique to be comfortable that there wasn't cancer somewhere else in the prostate. So the MRI hasn't been good enough to really give us good guidance. PSA is not a good tumor marker. The lowest PSA I've ever seen in a patient that I diagnosed with prostate cancer was 0 0.3. Now I've had PSAs in the thousands also for patients with very bad prostate cancers. So it has a huge range. Now we have an imaging technique though that is going to significantly change the uh, accuracy of saying whether somebody has localized prostate cancer and in what part of the prostate it's lo located and that's called the PSMA-11 scan. PSMA-11 is an excellent test, the best test that we have now for imaging prostate cancer. Uh, it's a, in the next couple of years, there are going to be some significant changes to it. Right now, the, the PSMA-11 is not very stable, and so it's only available in uh, a few places throughout the country. Uh, I understand you have that in San Diego now. We have it in Los Angeles. It's up in San Francisco. Um, but it doesn't have the same uh, universal uh, availability throughout the country, but that's about to change because there are two new forms of PSMA-11 that are being developed that will allow us to offer it to a lot more men. I'm gonna skip through this, okay. 
I'm going to stop at this point and uh, open this up for questions uh, because that's actually the favorite part of presentations for me is being able to answer your, your questions. I will end by saying, though, that every man should be screened every single year. Don't miss it. Don't forget it. One of the big problems with COVID is a lot of people have not had have not had cancer screening, period. Colonoscopies haven't been done. Mammograms haven't been done. PSAs and rectal exams haven't been done. So if you have not been screened, it's time to call your doctor and get in there to have a screening test. Um, screening starts between the age of 40 and 50. I'm a firm believer in early diagnosis of prostate cancer, so you have treatment options uh, that give you fewer side effects. Uh, if you are going to have a, a prostate biopsy, make sure your, your urologist is experienced in doing uh, biopsies. Uh, make sure that he or she understands multiparametric MRIs. When it comes time to talking about treatment options, uh, they should not just be telling you you can have surgery or radiation. They should be talking about HIFU and other treatments. Uh, and HIFU for me is the treatment that I offer my patients in most cases um, because I can preserve normal bladder function and sexual function. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, great presentation, doctor. Th thanks so much for all of that. Um, we do already have one question that has come in. Um, if, if you want to open your Q&A and, and uh, uh, address that one, I'm going to copy and paste a few other uh, questions that had come in uh, separately on a prior email. Um, but uh, everybody out there, please feel free to, to su submit some questions. So the question is, um, I was told that HIFU isn't useful if the gland shows calcification. Um, how do I weight, weight the issue? Well, the first, the, the, the first answer is it's correct. A calcification stops a HIFU beam. HIFU penetrates uh, solid tissue. However, it is unable to penetrate something like a calcification or stone which is what calcifications are inside the prostate. Now, those are different than kidney stones and bladder stones, but some of us do have true calcifications in the prostate. Well, sometimes um, the interpretation of an ultrasound is not really as um, correct as we would want. If you see a bright white area on ultrasound, a lot of people assume that's a calcification. What's important is to look at the area above that white spot, because sometimes, in fact, most of the time, we'll see ultrasound energy above it. Well, if it's above it, then that white spot is actually not a stone. It's an area of protein inside the prostate, and that we can penetrate. But if there is a true calcification, in general, more than a centimeter in size, then the area above it is not going to get enough heat. Now, if the cancer is not in that area, it doesn't really matter. If you have, have a calcification, though, in an area of cancer, uh, the calcification can be removed before a high food treatment. Uh, we use an old technique, the, the prostate resection or, or TORP or rotor rooter procedure to get rid of that calcification. And then we can go ahead and do high food a couple of weeks later. Um, we rarely have to do that procedure for the Sonoblate device. The other device on the market doesn't have a lot of, as much power so that's a more commonly used procedure. But bottom line is, if you have true calcification, it will stop a hyphen beam. Um, how does PSA density factor in? There are some people that believe in PSA density. Uh, I'm not sure it gives me enough information to decide whether or not to do a biopsy. Some people do use it for that. Um, my rationale is if your PSA uh, is not in the range that I'm comfortable with, I don't really care what the PSA density is. PSA density, by the way, is a, is a combination of, of a factor of total PSA factored into the volume of the prostate. That to me doesn't give me enough information to decide whether or not to do a biopsy. Uh, I will say this about PSA, and this is really important. There are at least two good PSA measures that should be looked at for every patient. It's the total PSA but also something called the free PSA. Now, free PSA is essentially is PSA that's not bound to proteins in your bloodstream, so it just kind of floats around freely. If we rely just on the total PSA, we oftentimes will end up diagnosing prostate cancers later than we should. If we look at a free PSA, we oftentimes will diagnose prostate cancers at a very early stage. 
that's how my prostate cancer was diagnosed. My PSA was 1.1, but my free PSA fraction was 18% and it should be over 25%. So it was below 25. I called a friend of mine who does HIFU and I said, I'd like to do a biopsy of my prostate. Uh, flew up north to see him, and indeed my biopsies were positive, showing prostate cancer. Had I not had the free PSA, I wouldn't have known that I had prostate cancer. Again, my cancer doesn't elaborate a lot of PSA. So I think if you have PSA testing, a total and free PSA is important. And if either one of those are abnormal in my practice, you get a biopsy. I'm not that focused again on PSA density, I'm focused on your PSA. Doctor, I think I saw in one of the slides a uh, mention of PCA-3, um, but I, I can't remember if you mentioned something about that. W w was that I, related to a different PSA test? It's a different PSA test, but it's actually something I need to, I apologize, I did not revise these slides um, completely. I did some, but not all. And so that needs to be taken. I don't use P uh, that anymore. There's a number of tests that uh, have kind of faded by the, the, the side here. Um, can I comment on out-of-pocket cost to patients for uh, HIFU, cryolaser today and in the foreseeable future? Well, uh, unfortunately, we're still in an era where the insurers have not picked up the cost of a HIFU procedure. Uh, we have had a, a working group uh, talking with CMS uh, for a couple of years now. Um, this is the second year we've spent a great deal of time trying to get them to reimburse high food at an appropriate level. Um, it's, I'll, I'll make this a short story. Um, in 2017, when CMS or Medicare started covering the high food procedure, uh, they reimbursed it at a level that was sufficient so that hospitals uh, and surgery centers could afford to offer the service. There are nine different levels of reimbursement in the CMS or Medicare system for outpatient procedures. HIFU was given level six. After 18 months for, uh, I'm not gonna go into all the reasons for it, but CMS decided to change from level six to level five, which made every hospital was going to lose money uh, doing the procedure. Uh, so it now moved to facilities that did not have Medicare contracts, uh, typically uh, freestanding surgical centers, uh, many of which don't have Medicare contracts. So the cost of a high food procedure uh, is $25,000. If somebody has Medicare, uh, Medicare will pick up $1,500 of that cost. So the out of pocket is $23,500. Cryoablation by and large is covered by insurance companies. Uh, if it's not, um, most hospitals will offer it somewhere between 15 and $30,000. Um, it, a hospital can can afford to do it at 15, but the way hospital charges are, uh, I know one patient recently was quoted $29,000 by a hospital, uh, but that's the general range. Laser procedures are, are in the same realm as high food procedures. So there are a number of um, uh, treatments that we have that are just not covered well enough by insurance. It's not that they're not covered, but they're not covered at an adequate level. Um, so that um, the question of is HIFU covered by insurance or Medicare? Yes, but not at an adequate level. Once Medicare brings it back up to the appropriate level, the other insurers will uh, be on board with this. But after, gosh, this year I was probably on six phone calls with uh, uh, Medicare uh, people. And uh, we have, again, this task force, and I'm the physician member of it. Uh, we learned about two weeks ago, Medicare said they're not changing the reimbursement level for next year. So 2022 will be the same, unfortunately. Wow, that's uh, unfortunate that they don't uh, cover it better. I almost wanna make a whole bunch of government officials uh, take uh, DREs and PSA tests and then um, tell them as a whole how many of them might have prostate cancer, but not tell them who <laughs> and see what they do about it. <laughs> uh, that, that would be an interesting, uh, effort. Uh, we are uh, working on some ideas to, to do a slightly different strategy for next year when we talk to these folks. Um, and it comes down to 
in part the politics of Washington, D.C., but it also comes down to um, uh, the fact that there are so many procedures that Medicare covers or any insurance company covers. I mean, tens of thousands of procedures. And for them to focus on, the, on a particular procedure and analyze the data and understand what it takes to offer that to people who don't have $25,000 to pay uh, and may, quite frankly, avoid having treatment and allow their cancers to grow because they don't want the side effects of what they're being offered, uh, it's terrible. And so they need to, we try to get them to understand that. Uh, I have so many patients who come to me wanting to have a HIFU procedure, having had having waited for years and years and years and finally deciding, okay, I'm going to do something about it. And by the time they come to see me, I can't treat that with HIFU alone. Now, I'm a firm believer in using HIFU, even prostate cancer, maybe outside the prostate, to reduce or eliminate what's inside the prostate and then adding something like radiation uh, as a secondary treatment called multimodality therapy. But the bottom line is uh, we need to make this available to everybody and we're not there yet. Yeah, and you know, um, um, along those lines, I, I, you certainly are um, pushing um, you know, similar young age ranges for getting um, uh, screening and so forth. Um, I, I can't remember the, what the exact cost was the, for a PSA screen but you know, given that I actually was found to have a PSA initially of nine at the age of 39, um, why not start at age 30 for everybody? Because you know, a DRE is essentially free with your annual uh, physical and uh, you know, a PSA test, I, I don't think is that expensive. Um, so why not push the ages even younger? Um, I think the yield at age 30 probably is not gonna be uh, adequate, certainly. Uh, age 40, yes, there's a Swedish study that says if your PSA is uh, 1.5 or more at age 40, your likelihood of getting prostate cancer uh, is much higher than if it is under that. So uh, we have not studied that well enough in the U.S., but I'm a firm believer uh, in earlier screening. So 35 may be a, a reasonable start, but certainly uh, age 40 at the latest. Uh, age 30, though, um, too young, given that you said, like, you know, 28 is now the youngest age, apparently. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, looking back, I highly imagine that I would have had a detectable PSA at 35. Um, I, and wish you that I'd had treatment earlier. You absolutely would have. Um, so it's, uh, I'm not going to argue with that. I, I think the earlier is better. Uh, whether what, what that number is, I'm not sure we know at this point in time. Yeah. Uh, it looks like we have a couple more questions that just came in. So how does HIFU factor in for higher grade Gleason scores? The traditional teaching for HIFU is if it's Gleason 3 plus 3 or 3 plus 4, uh, then HIFU is appropriate. But when it's 4 plus 3 or higher, uh, then HIFU may not be appropriate. Uh, I am firmly uh, opposed to that argument. Uh, any cancer cell, any cell in your body, even if, if it's benign, uh, cannot withstand a temperature between 92 and 100 degrees centigrade. It's going to be destroyed. So there's no reason not to do a HIFU procedure for someone who's got Gleason 4 plus 4, 4 plus 5 disease. Um, it's going to destroy that tissue. The real issue is when your PSA gets to that level, is it curable cancer by just treating the prostate itself? because those higher grade cancers have a much higher propensity uh, to spread. Uh, they oftentimes will grow faster. Uh, so it's not that they resist heat, but it's that they may be already outside the prostate area, even if we can't see something on an imaging study. Now, one of the challenges of prostate cancer treatment and follow-up is many uh, prostate cancers take years and years and years before we can diagnose them. So the, the current theory, which make, to me makes a great deal of sense, is that most of us have had prostate cancer for 10 years before it's diagnosed. From the time that first cancer cell develops to that cell doubling and those two cells becoming four cells and 16 and 256, on and on and on, the exponential growth takes a very long time and can take a good 10 years until it 
uh, grows enough to either cause a hard spot that we feel when we check the prostate or a change in your PSA. So if we have a prostate cancer that we treat, you go back to that CAPRA score that said uh, at a minimum 14% of cancers are outside the prostate when we are treated for them. And let's just say that a uh, hundred prostate cancer cells or 10 prostate cancer cells got out of my prostate the night before I was treated and they went somewhere else in me. The fact that four and a half years later, my PSA is excellent post-treatment doesn't mean I, I'm not gonna have recurrent prostate cancer in the future. It means that my, my PSA is excellent, nothing more than that. Over time, I'm gonna to continue to get my PSAs checked regularly because I want to be absolutely certain that it doesn't start to show a gradual rise because if so, I've got recurrent prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. So it's important that uh, once prostate cancer is uh, treated, you get ongoing follow-up. Never ever get to the point where you say, okay, it's, I hit the five-year mark or the 10-year mark and I'm fine because it can come back later. I have two patients in my practice now whose radical prostatectomies I personally did 21 years ago and both have rising PSAs 21 years later. Um, so it can take a long time. Mm -hmm. what, what are the, uh, I guess, you know, chances of, of being able to use HIFU for uh, detectable cancer outside of the, the prostate that's still like very, you know, close into the, the prostate? Or is it really just like, you know, once it's detected at all outside the prostate, like chances are it's, it's, it's spread quite a distance. No, I think it, it, it's reasonable to say that prostate cancer can just grow by extension through the prostate capsule into surrounding tissue. Uh, if it's visible uh, on an imaging study, then it is potentially treatable. So I will very frequently treat outside the prostate. Uh, if I see something on an MRI um, beforehand or something on the ultrasound that would concern me, uh, then I will take something outside of the prostate. But can I effectively treat everything? That's the issue. How far can you go safely? Not very far. Just like with surgery, you can't take a, a huge margin past the normal margins of surgery. You can take a little bit. Uh, that's a role for radiation, as far as I'm concerned. That's where radiation makes a lot of sense. I think you take that uh, radiation source and effectively treat an area around the prostate capsule or where the prostate was if one has surgery. That, to me, is where you have the potential for long-term disease-free periods or cures for patients uh, and not just rely on one particular modality. So for me, I like radiation as a, uh, a, a treatment that's given in conjunction with another primary treatment. That to me is where it makes a great deal of sense. HIFU, by the way, is now proposed for, and this is a true number, 101 other uh, areas in the body. Uh, there are clinical trials now ongoing for breast cancer. Uh, we have thyroid cancer. We have, uh, it's actually been fat, fascinating use uh, as uh, deep brain stimulation. Instead of implanting an electrode for patients who have essential tremor or Parkinson's tremors, University of Maryland has done some remarkable work uh, showing that you can use HIFU to eliminate uh, the tremor. Uh, and, so, and as you can by implanting an electrode for many of these patients, not all. Uh, I was in Washington, D.C. two years ago, lobbying on uh, Medicare in person for better HIFU reimbursement. We had some folks from the University of Maryland, and they uh, had with them a couple of their patients, one of whom uh, was an architect. He was 40 years old. He um, had a, a significant tremor that had to stop work. He had a HIFU treatment on one day and was back uh, at work the next day. His tremor was gone. So HIFU can uh, potentially be used for uh, tumors in many other parts of the body. Uh, it is, we have actually a HIFU probe uh, for uh, another location for cancer, but it's, it needs some refinement. But the bottom line is there are a huge number of possible uses for a technology that can deliver heat with great precision uh, wherever you aim it.
Gotcha, gotcha. So in the case of, of uh, solving the problems of, of the, the necessary tremors, it, it is actually destroying the, the, the nerve within the brain potentially? It's destroying the focus, it's giving that tremor. Uh, and so what they have done in the past is they've implanted an electrode uh, that will try to uh, control that area, but you can ablate the area, which is a prostate, which is what Hyfu does uh, with a Hyfu beam. Yeah, it, it sounds almost a little similar to, uh, you know, I've, I've heard of people in their, you know, hearts having some nerve, uh, or maybe it was actually a, a particular artery or something um, burned away or something. I, I, I forget the details on that one. Um, but uh, in, yeah, interesting. I, yeah, I, just as you'd mentioned this, I was, I was going to ask you if it's used elsewhere. You know, I, I think of you know, this, the size of the, the, the probe that you're using here and figured, well, you know, you could only then be able to go through the, uh, the, the mouth esophagus, you know, maybe for, for lung cancer, but I guess that you could also have surface style probes for, uh, for breast cancer or what, minimally invasive procedures? Um, I think we're at the very tip of the iceberg right now. Uh, mm -hmm. The potential for developing uh, smaller probes, flexible probes, uh, is, is pretty substantial. And I think you're going to see over the next uh, several years a lot of advances in hyper technology. Mm -hmm. Do you think it'll ever miniaturize enough to pass through a blood vessel, an artery? Um, I'm not smart enough to answer that. Uh, <laughs> I, the, the guys that work on this are the true heroes. I was fortunate when I trained uh, 17 years ago, I got to uh, sit side by side with the gentleman who invented Hyphy. And um, he was there for our treatments when we would treat patients in other countries. And you'd sit, he would sit next to you and you'd say, you know, it'd be great if I had a button that did this or a screenshot that did this. And sure enough, the next time you were treating patients, there was the button or the screenshot. These guys are brilliant. And so we get all the credit for treating patients, but the ones who really should be getting the credit are back in the laboratory and they are true rocket scientists. So I would leave that question you asked to him. I don't know. Yeah, uh, the name of the, um, the device again, what's the company that produced that? Well, this one is uh, the Sonoblate uh, uh, system. There is another system that's made in France. Uh, I think Sonoblate has a number of advantages in terms of its power level, its precision, um, and uh, ability to focus the beam. So the other device to me doesn't have that same ability. So it's a Sonoblade system. Uh, the company is based in North Carolina and the company that makes the actual uh, equipment is called Focus Surgery there in Indiana. Gotcha, uh, interesting. I'm always kind of, I'm an engineer. So, you know, I like to think about, you know, developing new, new products and what other uh, industries might be of interest someday. Well, the guy that came up with the hypo idea was one of the true uh, fathers of, of ultrasound. Uh, came up with, I believe it was uh, uh, echocardiography and uh, fetal ultrasonography and came up with the concept, can we use ultrasound not just to image, but to create some type of power somewhere to treat tissue? And took that idea and as you remarkable engineers typically do, you take a concept and make it into something real. Yeah, yeah. There is another open question. Are you able to see it in your screen? I do, okay. 37% um, of patients actual Gleason score uh, was higher than Gleason score after biopsy. Was that, I'm sorry, my glasses here, sorry. Was that only for trust biopsies or did it include fusion biopsies? It was not for fusion biopsies or MRI guided biopsies. It was only for trust biopsies. And can you remind us what a trust biopsy is? So uh, trust is transrectal ultrasound. So a biopsy done through the rectum as opposed to a transperineal biopsy. Um, I will tell you that, uh, and it's an excellent question, by the way, um, but it is to this day, uh, even with the newer biopsies, no one really questions this statistic. Uh, it's, it's a third or more of patients that are going to have more aggressive or more extensive cancer. Uh, it's pretty dramatic sometimes. Remember, unless we have an imaging test that allows us to see where the cancer is, and if we don't have that right now with the MRI, we're missing half of them, that statistic's not going to change. Now, will PSMA 11 change that? That's a possibility. 
Mm -hmm. So we will see. But that's that's our the, the hope now is that not only does PSMA 11 become more available, um, but it gets refined in a way that it's uh, able to see things in detail. Right now, it's sort of a sort of a hazy test. You can see you can see a lot, but an MRI really gives you when it sees something remarkable clarity as opposed to the PSMA 11 that really doesn't do that yet. Again, this is something that's going to be changing in the future as that test gets refined or some other imaging modality gets uh, uh, approved for high food, uh, for prostate cancer. All right. Um, so a couple of the other questions that came in, and unfortunately, I can't submit them through the Q&A um, screen itself. So let me read those off. Uh, so I understand there is evidence for an immune system boost by debulking the prostate, even in cases of metastatic disease. Can you comment on the current state of that evidence uh, if you don't already have a slide referring to studies that show this effect? Right, and I, I mentioned before that I'm a big fan of that concept because I think it makes a great deal of sense. Um, if you have a, a prostate cancer filling your prostate and there's 100 million cancer cells in there, you pretty much overwhelmed your any uh, ability of your immune system to help out here. Um, plus 11% of us have defective surveillance genes. So we've got a lot of issues with our immune system and cancer in general. Um, if you, there, but there definitely is data that shows not specific to HIFU, but with radiation and with surgery, that if you treat the primary cancer within the prostate for patients who either have or are at risk for having uh, extracapsular disease, cancer outside of the prostate, uh, that survival definitely improves in those patients. So I think the concept now is for patients who have more advanced cancers, uh, in my hands, I wanna treat what's in the prostate and then use whatever I need to, to treat what's outside of the prostate. Is what's outside of the prostate gonna be handled by the immune system alone? Not at this point in time, but as we get uh, further and further into the field of what's called personalized medicine, where someone looks at your specific cancer and says, this is the genetic makeup of your cancer, and we're gonna come up with a treatment to boost your immune system or inject something that's manufactured uh, in a laboratory to go after those cancer cells. That's where we're gonna be able to handle the more difficult cancers as well. Stop to think for a moment about PSMA 11. How does it work? It works because certain cells Prostate cancer cells have an affinity for PSMA11. Well, what if you could attach to PSMA11 some killer cells? So you now inject those PSMA11 slash killer cell compounds into somebody. PSMA11 goes and finds the prostate cancer and kills it. So those types of therapies are becoming more and more commonplace for many cancers where if we can label something and inject it, we can now target that cancer. So I think uh, the future is quite frankly, not high food. The future is not cryo. It's not surgery, it's not radiation. It's gonna be these therapies that are gonna target cells in our bodies. We're years away from having that effectively for prostate cancer, but there's a lot of work being done on it right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like these uh, smart bomb style uh, 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 treatments. Uh, they certainly give me a lot of hope for if mine comes back years from now. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, besides you, what other Southern California experts on cryotherapy are there? Uh, seems I've heard of someone affiliated with UCLA, but don't know his name. Probably the best one uh, in. SoCal is in your neck of the woods, UC San Diego. Uh, Dr. Parsons uh, is excellent at cryo. Um, he, I think, would be the go-to person in terms of experience. Um, he's just superb. Um, UCLA does um, some cryo, but I think Parsons really is, is superb. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, let's see. And... Um, Actually, have you done many debulking procedures for metastatic patients? Probably about three dozen at this point. And um, and are you available for telemedicine consultations? We actually do a lot of that because um, my practice was actually a very significant international practice until COVID came along. 
Uh, so we had patients really coming in from all over the world. And then uh, with COVID, that stopped. Now, all of a sudden, in the last oh, six months or so, not only are we seeing patients from all over the U.S., but now we're seeing patients from internationally calling as well. So we've had uh, what we call virtual consults for years. And, and so do you typically end up getting like a biopsy um, report as well as uh, like imaging from an MRI? What, what, what's the, I guess, the information that you work from that would have had to be done ahead of time or locally? So the basics are uh, a biopsy result and PSA. A lot of patients do not have MRIs when we talk, and the reason is their docs just don't do a lot of prostate cancer work, so they might get a CAT scan, which really is not a, a very helpful test when you're trying to evaluate whether prostate cancer is localized or not. Um, MRIs are much better. So if someone has an MRI, that's great, but if not, I'll order the MRI for them so we get it afterwards. But at a minimum, it's biopsy and PSA. Now, biopsy is an interesting issue because a lot of that depends upon the skill of the pathologist reading the biopsy. Uh, there are some pathologists who are excellent uh, because they, at prostate biopsy interpretation because they do a lot of it. Um, there are some that may not do uh, as much and sometimes we'll get second opinions on biopsy results uh, from some local people here that I use because they have a lot of experience with that. Uh, also, what technique was used for the biopsy? Uh, in the old days, you took a bunch of biopsies and you put them in one container. And then we went to two containers, left side and right side. And then we went to six containers, three from each side. But the proper way to do a biopsy is 12 containers, six from each side called a true template biopsy. Um, a lot of places don't do that. And so if the biopsy results are not adequate, then we'll sometimes uh, request or I will do a second biopsy on somebody. And, but that's assuming that somebody was considering focal therapy. If I have someone who's got biopsies from the left side and the right side of the prostate, and that's what's in the report, I can't recommend focal therapy because I don't know what I'm treating focally. I don't know where the cancer really is. Mm -hmm. um, if on the other hand, patient says, you know what, I want my whole prostate treated. I want whole gland high food. I don't need additional biopsies because the fact that there's cancer is enough to go on. So it, well, a lot depends upon the kind of treatment the patient is interested in. Gotcha. gotcha. Okay. Um, all right, well, that's, uh, I think all the questions that I had on my side, I don't see any others. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you so much for your time. This was a great presentation, uh, very informative. Um, and uh, I guess I will hope to talk to you again uh, in, in a, perhaps another couple of years and you can give us another update. I'll look forward to it. Thanks for having me today. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Glenn. Thank you, doctor. Pleasure. Bye now. Bye-bye.